Hello and welcome to On Geopolitics with Ali Ansari and Suzanne Ray. This podcast looks at geopolitical issues in the historical context and today's focus is really on the historical. We're joined by two eminent historians, Professor Brendan Sims and Dr Charlie Lederman. Brendan is Professor of the History of European and International Relations at the University of Cambridge and our very own Director of the Centre for Geopolitics. And Charlie is a senior lecturer at King's College London and a researcher at the Hoover Institute. Thank you, Suzanne. And today we are going to be talking about their new book, a new book which is just out, Hitler's American Gamble, uh, which I have to say, uh, having read over the past few days, is an absolutely fascinating read. And uh, I wondered if either of you wanted to start off by telling us what the main thesis of the book is. Uh, Thanks, Ali and Suzanne. Great to be with you. In this book, what we're trying to do is look at what we consider to be the five most significant days of the 20th century, which is the period between Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and Hitler's declaration of war on the United States. And that period previously has been seen as being one where the decision is basically made by Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, that there's there's a sense of inevitability that as a result of that, the United States will come full-blown into the Second World War. And what we're trying to show in that book is what the American diplomat George Kennan called the excruciating uncertainty of that period, just how much was up in the air that for those five days, there was such uncertainty and such a sense of of people not really knowing around the world what what would happen. So it's really a global history of those five days, the lead up, to Hitler's gamble to declare war on the United States and how that transformed international history. The only thing I would add to that is that we also provide a kind of a deep history of uh, Hitler's engagement with the United States. Uh, And it's often said that Hitler declares war on the United States uh, because he's unaware of the industrial power and the sheer raw strength of the United States. But in fact, what we show is the exact opposite. He declares war on the United States because of its great power and his anxiety that it's going to be used against him. And, you know, the, 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 the sort of granularity of, of, of the book, extraordinary. I mean, the, the level of detail you've put in there and the way in which it looks at, you know, policy formation from the ground up. I mean, I thought this was one of the, the great benefits of a book of this nature, that it actually, as you say, both of you, you know, one is that it shows the complete uncertainty of, you know, these critical five days and sort of shaping uh, geopolitical alliances. But also, Brendan, as you say, you know, this sort of, it's slightly counterintuitive, isn't it, in terms of Hitler's relationship with, as he called it, the Anglo-Saxon powers. That's right. So he, he sees the conflict as a global conflict, not merely between Germany and, and uh, the British Empire, uh, or between Germany and what he regards as, as the forces of world Jewry, uh, but also a much wider struggle against what he calls the Anglo-Saxon powers, which is not just not just the British Empire, but also the United States. And he feels that the Anglo-Saxon powers have essentially run the world uh, for the past few hundred years uh, and are refusing to cut the Germans and the other, what, what he calls have-nots, that is to say the uh, Imperial Japan and fascist Italy, to cut them in, as it were, uh, on this racket. Um, And secondly, he sees Germany, the German Reich, as being engaged in a life and death struggle with the forces of international capitalism, of of plutocracy, as he calls them. And he sees these forces as being in part Jewish, but also in part Anglo-Saxon. So he he, he refers to a kind of an Anglo-Saxon Jewish symbiosis, which is running the world uh, and oppressing uh, the Germans and the other have-nots. Charlie, can can you set the scene for us? The book is so dramatic, an almost cinematographic five-day period where you can feel the clock ticking all the time in the background. And it would be helpful for us to sort of understand day minus one, the day before. What is the world that Pearl Harbor happens into? And you're absolutely right. Timing is is so critical to this book and to try and recreate in real time what happens in order to be able to put yourself in the position of those actors at the time. And so we look at, as Brendan said, the the, the background to this crisis. But then you you come in on, on the world of December the 6th, how the world looks prior to Pearl Harbor, where for so many of the major players, things are so uncertain in the war. The war is really in the balance, particularly in Europe. And for Churchill, there's a, there's, a, there's a great sense that even though he had been hoping ever since he'd come into power and his whole strategy is based around 
the United States coming into the war um, to aid Britain, he is really uncertain about what will happen. Is it going to be the case the United States is going to come into the war as a full belligerent? Is it going to stay out? Is it going to come in in Europe? Is it going to come in in Asia? These are sort of the questions that are going through Churchill's mind and everyone's mind at that period. It's what, it's, it's what the whole conflict now hinges upon. And what we see is that Churchill's great um, fear is that the United States will be um, will not come into the war, that Japan will attack the British Empire in Asia, and basically Britain will have this war on two fronts, the United States will still be out. And so that's really the background to what happens on the lead up to December the 7th, that Churchill's concerned from that perspective, Roosevelt is still uncertain about non-interventionists and isolationists in America, that they're going to keep the Americans out as well. So from the, from the Anglo-American side, there is a real sense of, of uncertainty and of, of trepidation about what the future holds. These worries are also replicated on the Axis side. So Hitler, for instance, is deeply concerned about the very high level of support uh, that's already been given by Roosevelt's America through the Lend-Lease program to the British Empire, but also to Stalin's Russia. And that's in and of itself could be enough in time uh, to swing the balance. Uh, but he's also uh, worried about the Japanese. Uh, he'd very much like the Japanese to come in uh, on uh, to attack the British Empire, uh, also to attack the Americans, to pin them down while he deals with the Russians. Well, he's worried that the Japanese, A, won't do that, and B, even if they do do it, that they might go down to defeat. So he's resolved that he will support the Japanese if they attack. The Japanese, on the other hand, feel they can't trust the Germans. Yes, Hitler has promised to support them. But as many people say, and we quote these voices uh, uh, at some length in the book, many people within the imperial leadership in Japan say that actually Hitler is prejudiced against the Japanese and that some kind of white alliance uh, between the British Empire, the Americans and the Germans is possible, shutting out the Japanese. So really, as we head into Pearl Harbor, nobody is really confident in the outcome and nobody's really sure what's going to happen. And that's a fascinating theme that I think we're going to pull on a bit, that you can't rely on your allies. So so not only no trust with, between adversaries, but but even the alliances, which are not really proper alliances, mm. or, you know, that that that's something we'll come into more. Sorry, Charlie. No, I was just going to say that, that, is the, that is the major theme leading up. No one trusts anyone. It's an extremely complicated situation. And, and, and what, what we try to show is that December the 7th, 1941 does not resolve all of this uncertainty. And that's sort of the, the established narrative on this, that Pearl Harbor basically resolves all of those things that Brent and I have talked about. And, and our, our purpose in the book is to say, actually, it, to, to a certain extent, things become, for some of the players, even more complicated. I mean, what you're basically saying is that, you know, Hitler decided on effectively a preemptive strike of his own with, with the Americans. I mean, because he felt a conflict would come eventually, but but had decided that now was the time to basically take the risk. You know, that's a sort of a, a you know, one of the more you know fascinating insights, because as you say, you know, people tend to view it. And, you know, I was very struck, for instance, about, you know, Hitler's uh, understanding of the United States and Britain going back really to the First World War. I mean, that was that was really quite striking. And he always sort of imagined the the, the Americans coming in late in the day and, and delivering the knockout blow, in effect. So he wanted to get in there early. I thought that was, um, as you say, it is quite the gamble, but it's immensely understandable in terms of the internal logic that they might have had, I suppose. Do you think Hitler was surprised when the Japanese did it? Hitler was certainly surprised tactically. He, he didn't know when the attack was going to happen. And all the accounts we have, because he receives the message uh, in the evening uh, of the 7th of December uh, in the Wolf's Lair at Rustenburg in eastern Prussia, which is his military headquarters. It's cut off, really, from the rest of the world. Uh, he's completely surprised. He gets a, a, a radio message. Uh, he then runs and tells everybody. All the accounts agree that he is genuinely astonished. But, of course, he knew that the Japanese were planning an attack, uh, and he had told the Japanese that he would he would support them. And in his mind, and here uh, I completely agree with what Ali has said, in his mind, this is a preemptive strike against uh, the United States, because the one thing he wants to avoid, and he refers to this uh, on several occasions during this period, is a repeat of what happened in the First World War, which is when President Wilson was able to choose the moment to declare war. And he says, this time, I'm going to preempt them. I'm going to declare war first. And, and there are people within the German system in the Foreign Office who are saying, 
well, why are we doing this? Wouldn't it be better uh, to put Roosevelt in the quandary and force him to declare war? But Hitler's clear he will preempt Roosevelt and he will deliver on his commitment to the Japanese. So, so at the same time, obviously the Americans and the British are also surprised for their own reasons in terms of failing to understand what the warning signs might have been. The way Churchill presents it afterwards, he knew exactly what was going to happen. But I think your research has shown that actually it didn't feel like that at the time sitting in London. And the first concern was that the US was going to turn all its attention to the Pacific, which is a bit reminiscent of what's happening now, Mm -hmm. actually. No, that's absolutely right. Churchill's memoirs have really shaped our understanding of so much of the Second World War because they were written soon after the fact. I mean, Churchill's famous line that history will judge me kindly because I intend to write it. Um, you, you, you see that in relation to this period as well and how much his perspective, his sense that he went to bed after Pearl Harbor and slept the sleep of the saved and thankful because we had won after all. How much that's that, that just doesn't appear to be the case in those few days. I mean, certainly it's the case that most people who see him during those few days say he looks exact, he looks completely exhausted. And it's because of those reasons that you mentioned, Suzanne, just how his sense is the United States is going to focus um, completely on Japan. And the main thing comes down to, to Lend-Lease supplies and how reliant Britain was on those supplies, on those supply chains from the United States. And his concern immediately afterwards is that he needs to get to Washington to make sure that those supplies aren't stopped to Britain. And it's the case that in those, um, in those few days, um, the US and Britain do get a whole um, load of intelligence that's coming through on what's happening. But as Roosevelt's speechwriter says, how can you be certain that someone like Hitler will allow these sort of like bourgeois considerations of having made this pledge to Japan to ultimately guide his actions? And what's also clear, and, and one of the things I think is, is fascinating, as Brendan says, just how much um, sense between the Japanese and the Germans of a lack of trust there is. And the British and the Americans are reading this in these intelligence um, briefings. That there's, there's at one point the Japanese say to their ambassador in Berlin that although we're not going to tell the Germans we're going to attack, we still expect them to follow through on their pledge. Um, so make sure that they do that, even if we're not going to tell them. And the British and the Americans are reading this and and the sense really is, well, how much trust is there between these, these two powers? And so there's, there's a real sense of uncertainty on that side. But the main thing comes back to supplies. And that's a really big part of our book. And something which, as I say, I don't think has come out before, just how Pearl Harbor really transforms the supply picture because the Americans on the night of Pearl Harbor suspend lend these aid to Britain and the Soviet Union with potentially devastating consequences. I mean, two of the things that I thought come up very well in the book, one is this whole sort of logistical nightmare that really comes up that, you know, how are you going to supply the war in these various theatres and what the Americans are going to do? I have to say the other thing that completely baffled me in a way, I understand it shouldn't have, but it did, was the fact that we're operating in such distinct time zones. So it didn't, you know, I suddenly realised, you know, as I was reading through this, when you suddenly go into December the 8th, that of course, it's December the 8th in, uh, where is it? I think in, in Europe. Or, or, or in Japan. No, I beg your pardon. In Japan, it's December the 8th. But of course, it's still December the 7th in the United States and other. And um, again, that sort of just, uh, I, I thought the book did, you know, really well to try and sort of highlight the, this particularity of the way in which messages were being sort of sent basically around the world and, and who was receiving what where. And that just added, I suppose, that element of, as you say, you know, Churchill's doubt and these other things about what, what exactly the response was going to be from the United States. Um, I thought that was very striking because I think it's something that we don't really see in these sort of rather more abridged histories. And as you say, uh, Charlie, you know, obviously the great abridgment is Churchill's own history of the Second World War, you know, where he sort of basically uh, glosses over certain things that might have been a bit more difficult at the time. But it reminded me also a little bit about the book that was done about, you know, the eight days in May or whatever, you know, when we look at, you know, that sort of element of what was going on within British political life at the time. And that, you know, fundamentally, in, a, in an interesting way that, you know, it is it is all quite political, isn't it? It's all about political decisions. And these political decisions have huge military consequences. Charlie, can I, I'm coming in on the back of Ali's question, but one of the things that I found really fascinating in the book was how constrained Roosevelt felt by his own domestic politics. So, so there was not political support within America for US engagement in a war against Hitler. 
Um, and he managed to sneak through the Lend-Lease thing um, through Congress, but I think that wasn't straightforward. But even right up to Pearl Harbor, I think, as I understand it from your book, the you know the popular opinion mm. polls were were way over the majority against him taking action to support mm. the UK. So, do you think if Hitler hadn't have declared war, mm. it would have been a very potentially a very different situation? Still, wouldn't I know these are counterfactual mm. histories, but. Yes, and I think that's that's something we try to do is, is to try and retrace things at the time, how things were seen from the White House, but also beyond the White House, what's going on in in American society. And as you say, Suzanne, right up until the the um, the days before Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt is very uncertain. The opinion polls that he's getting suggest that no more than about a quarter of Americans uh, want to um, recognize a, a declaration of war against against Germany. There's there's a huge amount of um, of uncertainty and, and and the non-interventionist lobby are extremely strong at that time, and I think the the mythology around this again is based around people's sort of past recollections. So the um, the sort of non-interventionist senator Arthur Vandenberg would would famously say that um, that that day Pearl Harbor ended isolationism for any realist. But actually, if you look at what Vandenberg is writing at the time, and if you look at what a lot of the non-interventionists are writing at the time, there isn't really a sense that the United States is inevitably going to get into a war with Germany. The focus is on Japan, very much so. And across all of the the America First Committee puts out a statement um, on the night of December 7th um, supporting the war with Japan. But it's very clear that they don't extend that to Germany as well. And the internal deliberations within America First are... This doesn't change the situation with regard to Germany. This, the arguments against war with Germany are just the same. And actually, one of the things we tried to show is Roosevelt is under a huge amount of political pressure because the sense is that the United States has been giving away and allowing much of its best materiel and most of its ships to be in the Atlantic. Has that left the United States exposed in the Pacific? And now the sense is from the non-interventionist crowd who, who, who sort of morph into becoming sort of Asia firsters. And their sense is we, we can't allow all of our material to continue to be going to the British and the Soviets. Our focus has to be on our own war and fighting against the country that's attacked us. So that sense of uncertainty is so critical and I think has, has not really been brought out in, in many of the studies of the US reaction in the past. And this was part of the German calculations as well and very clearly articulated uh, not only by by Hitler, but also in particular by Goebbels, uh, also in, in news broadcasts, in, in newspaper articles, where in the uh, days after Pearl Harbor, so before uh, the Hitler's declaration of war on the United States, they're crowing and saying, now look, um, Churchill is going to be uh, deprived of this Lend-Lease material, uh, and it's all not working out uh, for him. So, so, the, so these concerns, which have been discussed at high political level uh, in the United States and, and in Britain are, are also being um, experienced or also being understood uh, on the Axis side of the ledger. Uh, and they see this as a great opportunity for them. I was really struck. I mean, uh, one of the things that Brendan and I wrote was that, you know, at one stage Hitler was trying to sort of persuade, you know, Stalin to stick with him by offering offering him bits of India or something, you know, and sort of let's all split up the British Empire and share it amongst us. That's right. That was at an earlier stage in the autumn of 1940, when this alliance that I've referred to against the Anglo-Saxons, against international capitalism, uh, this alliance was not merely uh, of the Axis powers, so Imperial Japan, Fascist Italy and, and the German Reich, but there were also attempts to include the Soviet Union in it. Because, of course, ever since August 1939, uh, with the Hitler-Stalin Pact, uh, the two had been closely linked and had been sending each other various forms of equipment, and had collaborated to, to defeat Poland. And indeed, um, a, as you're suggesting, um, the Germans, uh, Hitler had held out to Molotov on a visit to uh, to Berlin in November 1940, held out the possibility of gains at the expense of the British Empire in Central Asia. But Stalin is too canny. Uh, he's not going to go down this route until he's absolutely sure that the British Empire is done for. And by the way, similar offers are made Uh, to Franco, who's also too canny, or some might say too greedy, um, because the British really show in the course of 1940 that there's still a lot of fight in them, not only the Battle of Britain, but also the destruction of the Vichy French fleet at Oran 
uh, and other actions. Um, so while the appetite might be there with Stalin, uh, there was also sufficient caution on his side uh, not to do it. So can I can I just follow on from that? And I'll do, because you know one of the key I suppose queries of the whole thesis, and particularly, and I think it came also from your previous book as well, is to what extent you know Hitler was driven really by this sort of anti-Bolshevik sentiment, and to what extent obviously it's the Anglo-Saxon powers. And so I suppose you know the question is. You know, you're saying in August sort of 1940, he's still toying with the idea of offering Stalin the things to keep him on board. And yet, you know, within six months or eight months, essentially, well, I mean, earlier than that, obviously, Barbarossa has been prepared. Let's say for the sake of argument and here, as, as Suzanne says, we're slightly heading into counterfactuals here. But it is, I suppose, you know, one of these interesting aspects, because as Charlie was saying earlier, you know, it's, it's, it's also this, you know, nobody trusts anyone. If for the sake of argument, Britain had been defeated in 1940. I mean, presumably Hitler would have still then turned eastwards. I mean, that would have still been one of his one of his objectives, right? Or, or have I have I read that incorrectly? No, I think almost certainly. I mean, the final decision for Barbarossa, by the way, is in December 1940. So it's after these conversations with Molotov, and then to a certain extent, our reaction to them. But we need to understand Hitler's decision to attack the Soviet Union in the context of his antagonism against the Anglo-Saxon powers. So even if he'd overrun Britain, he would still have had to deal with the United States and, of course, with the British Empire, because the British Empire would have carried on the fight from Canada, from South Africa, from India, and from Australia, and would simply then have waited for the United States to come in. And so the attack on the Soviet Union has always been conceived in terms of living space, of Lebensraum, so you, you need living space in order to balance the great empire of the United States and of the British Empire. And when you're at war with the British Empire, which, of course, has cut you off through the blockade from the resources of the globe, you also need uh, the grain and the raw materials of the Soviet Union. So the entire strategic conception of Operation Barbarossa is primarily as, as a way of dealing with the Anglo-Saxon problem. That's not to say, of course that Hitler is not also anti-Bolshevik or anti-Soviet. But the, uh, the quest for living space is, is, is a quest to balance Anglo-America. So in the hierarchy of his concerns, worry about the British Empire and the United States and worry about international capitalism uh, generally trumps worry about the Soviet Union uh, and about uh, uh, the uh, threat from Bolshevism. I'm going to move us on a bit to pull out some of the themes which come out of these sort of five days. And for me, one of the perennial themes of, of geopolitics actually is calculating or miscalculating on the basis of your understanding of what the adversary might do. And you you show in the book how each, you know, how Washington and London and, and Tokyo and Berlin, how they were all trying to sort of piece together what the other capitals yeah. were thinking. And, and that that requirement for understanding was, as we said earlier, it was between allies as well as between, you know, America mm. and Germany. And you had, um, I mean, there's this wonderful quote from um, Churchill's special envoy in Singapore, Duff Cooper, who said there was an atmosphere full of rumours, but basically nobody could work out what mm. was going on. And in fact, British, you could argue that British prejudices against the Japanese caused them to draw the wrong conclusions from from sort of Japanese build up around Hong Kong. Who do you think of the of the four? Should we say of the four, or do we include Russia? Which country had the best understanding, both both of their allies and the, of their adversaries, and who got it most spectacularly wrong? Yeah, that's. It's a great question. And it's one of the things that we try to do in the book in terms of in terms of grand strategy on, on the broadest possible scale is to understand what's going on globally and in and to understand that strategically, but also what's going on domestically in terms of your public opinion and in terms of your bureaucracies. And that and that's something which for the leaders, they've got to get all of those. They've got to try and understand all of those things. And that's sort of the complexity of things. I think for, for my sense, I think Roosevelt. Um, the way in which he handles these five days is extremely impressive, but at the same time is extremely precarious. So you you see Roosevelt across these five days managing to keep, for the most part, quite calm in a very, very difficult situation. I mean, the sense is, I think we look back and the sense is, well, 
was Roosevelt's sense that America needed to come into the war vindicated. That might be the long view perspective. At the time, Roosevelt was under huge political pressure and huge, um, not just political pressure, but strategically, the US was in a really difficult situation. Its, its whole West Coast was had suddenly become extremely precarious. Um, Japan had domination of, um, of, of much of the Pacific, particularly after December the 10th, when it sinks the British battleships um, and the Prince of Wales and, and, the, and the Repulse. And so Roosevelt is having to play this up, but at the same time, doesn't want to get sucked into a Japan-only war. He knows that that's not what he wants, but he's under some pressure domestically for it. But he knows that even though there's some within the administration who are saying, we've got to take this opportunity, we've got to declare war on Germany, we can't let this crisis pass, Roosevelt manages to sort of keep his calm politics, keep to sort of a long-term strategy, and basically sort of position the United States in such a position that it's Hitler who makes that decision makes that declaration. Again, you come back to counterfactuals. We could always say, well, what would have happened if Hitler had reversed himself? And there was no guarantee that Hitler would have done it. I was struck by the way in which Roosevelt sort of handles that situation um, under a huge amount of stress um, and is able to position the United States in, in a fast that sort of understands Hitler's character, essentially, and, and recognises Hitler as the great adversary. So do you think he expected Hitler to behave as Hitler behaved, or do you think mm. it was a surprise to him? I think I think that's 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 really complex within there because I think a lot of the established narrative would say that the the intelligence the, the Roosevelt had this intelligence knowing that Hitler would declare war. But I think what we try and show in the book is how conflicted that intelligence was. That there's a, there's a lot of intelligence out there, but none of it is pointing that this will guarantee a, a German declaration of war. I mean, right up until the morning of the eleventh. There's uncertainty as to whether Hitler will declare war or whether he might just sort of um, put out a statement of support in favour of Japan. Hitler could have really, um, really, really messed with with Roosevelt in that sense. And so I think initially Roosevelt is is really uncertain and 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 doesn't know how Hitler will act. I think by the ninth or tenth, he's quite convinced that, that that Hitler will declare war. But timing is also really critical, and that's something which we try and show throughout the book. If Hitler had held off for weeks, um, then that would have put the Allies in a really, really difficult position, from a, particularly on the supply chain issue. And that is that is critical to the book, is, is the timing of this. So in hindsight, Roosevelt looks, looks like the master of the situation. But as you say, Suzanne, things could have gone in a very different, different direction. So, so Hitler clearly misreads the situation uh, in the same way that, that Roosevelt ultimately reads it correctly. But what, I, what we thought was so interesting about these five days is that Hitler gets one big thing right and a very big thing wrong. The thing he gets right in terms of understanding his enemy is that Roosevelt is implacably hostile. That is not paranoia on Hitler's side. Of course, Roosevelt has very good reasons, given Hitler's uh, Jewish policies, his policies of aggression and so on, uh, to have that view of Hitler. That's absolutely beyond dispute. But equally, Hitler's assessment of Roosevelt's enmity, which really goes back to his famous uh, his reaction to, to, to Roosevelt's famous quarantine speech uh, in the autumn of 1937. Um, so Hitler's assessment of that is correct. Uh, and he, the idea that Roosevelt is trying to bring the United States into the war against Hitler is also correct. What Hitler gets wrong is that uh, he, he basically lets Roosevelt off the hook. So long as Hitler does not declare war, Roosevelt, because of what had happened during the First World War, because of the opposition from the isolationists, he is not really in a position or he doesn't feel strong enough to declare war of his own accord. And so, as Charlie said, if Hitler had simply strung it out another few weeks or another few months, uh, by the beginning of 1942, when you've got the fall of Hong Kong, you've got the uh, impending fall of Singapore and later of uh, quite soon of, of the Philippines, you're in a completely different situation where the Japanese are already rampant, uh, not merely over Pearl Harbor, but actually territorially across much of, of uh, the Far East. It would have been extraordinarily difficult for Roosevelt to persevere with the Germany first policy under those circumstances. And by declaring war uh, on 
Roosevelt on, on the United States on the 11th of December, 1941, which is the moment at which our book um, or the main narrative essentially ends. Hitler then lets Roosevelt off the hook uh, and then basically makes possible the narrative that we know, which is one that thinks that all of this was inevitable. That's one of the things which is sort of one of the subtleties of the book that we try to, to bring out. As, as Brendan says, that, uh, and one of the things which, we, which we, we're not saying that the US and Germany were were not necessarily going to be in tensions and in conflict with each other. We say that that, that was inescapable, the, the conflict between the US and Germany. But timing is so, so critical within this. And it's just it's just not clear that and, and, and there's and I think it, what the five days, I think, show is that if Hitler had avoided a declaration of war on December the 11th, then it's not clear when those hostilities would have occurred uh, between the US and Germany. It's not clear that Roosevelt was moving inexorably towards a declaration of war. I think everything, all, all of the evidence points towards the fact that he doesn't feel that the United States is in, a, is in a position to preempt this because he thinks that that politically at home will look um, will look like him exploiting the crisis. And I think that that's sort of that's critical to to the whole basis of the book is that. The decision taken at that time on December the 11th transforms the conflict, and it didn't have to happen that way. There's, there's, there's no, there was nothing inevitable about that decision other than in Hitler's own mind. I'm going to draw us to a close now, and that's a nice place for us to end. Mm. This is a tantalising small hors d'oeuvre for your book, which is a brilliant way to tell history because it really brings it alive on that day by day you sort of working through the thought processes of of each of them and that's kind of history which should help us look at everyday modern geopolitics in that way as well nothing mm. is certain for the future um and every decision is taken not knowing what the future can be i think there's the two things that certainly i i drew from it was one as charlie says timing is of absolutely paramount importance you know the way when you choose you know to do things um has such a bearing on 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 the outcome uh, but also this idea that you know people are making decisions based on very limited intelligence. So it's 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 that which again you know I think hindsight gives us this impression that everything's working very smoothly, but actually uh, as I think you've shown really well in those five days, there's uh, there's a great deal of anxiety going on as people are trying to work out what on earth is going on and then what on earth we do about it, which I think has a very you know pertinent uh, lesson for us today. So thank you, gentlemen, very much for your time. Thank you, listener, for being with us. I hope you enjoyed it. Join us next time. But until then, goodbye from Ali and I. Bye.